from our studios in the heart of Silicon Valley, Palo Alto, California. This is a CUBE Conversation. Hello everyone, welcome to this special CUBE Conversation. I'm John Furrier, host of the CUBE. We're here in our Palo Alto studios with two great guests from Cisco as we talk about a content series around cloud, cloud management, cloud orchestration, and actually cloud native, it's a cloud native world, hybrid multi-cloud. Two great guests, Matt Ferguson, Director of Cloud Management Orchestration at Cisco, and Ali G, Technical Leader in Software Engineering. Guys, thanks for coming on, pretty good to see you. Thank you for having yeah, us. Sporting the you. nice Kubernetes shirt there, of course, I'm jealous. <laughs> uh, great, great shirt, of course, we'll be at KubeCon, so looking forward to that. Absolutely, yeah, we'll thanks be there too. So thanks, for, Matt. First, start with you. You're the director of product management. So you see the whole portfolio. Yeah. Um, what makes up the cloud center suite? What are the components? Let's get that out. Yeah. No. Thanks. I appreciate that. Um, cloud center is really our cloud management platform. Um, it's a suite of products, quite candidly. And the, in the in the uh, suite, we have uh, a workload manager um, module that is about taking uh, workloads and modeling them out in blueprints, and then actually targeting them to very specific infrastructures, whether that's on-prem or in a public cloud. So that's module number one. The second module is our Action Orchestrator product. And this is an orchestration platform that can take various elements uh, of code, of script, um, and, and take functions and, and actually sort of apply those with, uh, with various different sort of capabilities to uh, either uh, set up infrastructure or you know, do other sort of capabilities. Um, and the third product um, in the suite is um, Cost Optimizer. And this is about understanding how much you're spending. Um, it's understanding budgets. It's trying to categorize that in the public space. We can also apply that um, into um, an on-prem in how much you might want to sort of target that. We have, so that's the suite, and the suite is uh, in a combination of either self-hosted, so you can actually sort of like download the software and self-host it on-prem, or we also have a, a SaaS um, uh, platform or SaaS hosted um, capabilities for the Cloud Center. And certainly the market's growing like crazy. You guys are doing a lot of product work. We've done a great interview with Reinhardt from your team right. on the business benefits, but there's a lot of technical product managers out there, cloud architects, people who are actually in the trenches who need to look under the hood and figure out if this kind of is going to fit their environment. Ali, you've been you know, a developer, you are a developer. At the end of the day, all the talk on the marketing side is about the benefits. When they come into you and they say, okay, implement this. Right. I mean, does it work together? Can I work by itself? I mean, you, can you mix and match? Take us, take us through what it means for the folks who have to implement or design around the, the platform. Absolutely. So, <clears throat> as a developer, you know, when we're coding, it's, it's key that we take our thoughts and ideas and as soon as we can, bring it up to a POC. Because normally we're working in an agile fashion. And then two week sprints, at the end of the sprint, you have to do a demo. So in order to achieve that, uh, this suite gives the capability of taking away any blockers that a developer may have. So a lot of times the developers and the teams have already set up their tools around Jenkins and different CI components that they have, which is great, but you know, me being uh, in that part of the work and we hit roadblocks where uh, failures happen right, and we have to have our eye on the builds. And unfortunately, there are manual you know, interactions that we have to do retries. It would be great if the system was fault tolerant. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to completely remove what we've done inside our CI CDs, right? We've spent so much time. However, if we can bring idempotent commands and loose couple them a little bit and use the suite in order for us to do some of the work and give us that fault tolerancy, that would be great. And um, that's what Cloud Center Suite has to offer, right? As Matt pointed out, you know, there are different components to it. Mm -hmm. um, you have the workload manager, which set up the infrastructure, but then you have AO Action Orchestrator, which is the orchestration engine, where I strongly believe that uh, picking out an orchestration engine, either for your CI, CD, and DevOps work, or even at the application level for development becomes challenging, right? Um, does it support all the features that I have? Does it have the patterns that does um, fault tolerancy? Does threshold settings and retries? Does it do circuit breaker patterns? You know, does it take care of everything? Um, so having that AO being your center of orchestration, both for your DevOps and your application, 
I feel that plays a strong role as a developer, right? So, so talk about the orchestration engine. I want to unpack. It's a lot there. I want to just kind yeah. of um, unpack it a little bit. Okay, so I'm a developer. I'm like, okay, I'm working hard. I got the cloud architecture. I've got some cloud native, and every single day a new thing comes over the transit. Try this new tool. It's going to be killer. Orchestration, you mentioned, is a buzzword that's been kicked around a lot. Obviously, some people try to say, orchestration is about Kubernetes. Some people say, no, orchestration is about a lot of other things within right. the enterprise. So, IT is starting to get this orchestration fatigue of meaning. What is, when you say orchestration engine, what is it specifically applying to? Because certainly there's orchestration within containers with Kubernetes. Absolutely, that's good. this support in the shirt, right. but it's more than that. What does that mean for me? I'm the person in the trenches, I'm making it happen. No, that's, that's a great question. Um, the reason it's a great question is because orchestration means different things at different levels. And you brought up a good point like Kubernetes. Kubernetes is an orchestration, but it's a container orchestrator, correct? But I'm looking at action orchestrator acting as the orchestration for your DevOps activity um, as part of your CI CD. Not everything needs to be inside our CIs, whether as if there are command patterns that are item potent in design that could move into the action orchestrator so that we can leverage retries and have the system be fault tolerant. That's one thing. The other thing is if you're building an application that requires orchestration, that has a workflow, that requires some requests that are given to the application to be processed at the back end, right? That could also leverage this action orchestrator engine as well. So you're absolutely right that orchestration is there, for example, in Kubernetes, but that falls into the context of containers, whereas this falls into the context of developers. Does that? Yeah, to make still sense. I mean, fault tolerance you mentioned, you mentioned loosely coupled. Right. Um, what do you mean by that? Because my, I get loosely coupled, anyone that designed OS's knows. You yeah. want to couple things and make things highly cohesive. Yeah. Great practice in, in the systems architecture. What do you mean by loosely coupled? What's the impact of me as I'm trying to figure out my, my DevOps, my got developers, yeah. pipeline, what, what's the, what's, what does that mean, loosely coupled? So when it goes to keeping loosely coupled is if you look at today how, let's say I would have done it in my team, and I've, we've done this before, right? is that we'd set up a pipeline in our CI environment where we're performing unit testing and then we're performing integration testing, but then we're also building, packaging, pushing the containers up to the registries, right? What happens where um, the endpoint registry is down? There is no retries, right? There is no capability of the system knowing how to heal itself, okay? So keeping loosely coupled in this sense is why not I keep a lot of my UT and integration testing remaining inside Jenkins, which I've done already a lot of investment in, right? I don't want to remove it, right? However, if I bring those third-party connection calls that we're doing inside the orchestration, which the system heals itself, that's where I see the loose coupledness that can definitely benefit us here. Talk about uh, third-party. Uh yeah, let's, uh, Matt, you talk about it first from a product perspective, you yeah. have a roadmap to deal with. Obviously Cisco has legacy um, positions in the enterprise, and you guys are number one in networking and other areas. Now the cloud native world's here, you got to deal with third party. You guys have done that, been multi-vendor in the past. There's a business and technical impact yeah. in connecting. Right. As the world's getting faster and, and more serve, microservice oriented, yeah. what does that mean third party? What does that mean to be third party connected? Yeah, it's it's a great question. So we're we're going through this um, you know transition as well, where where we have to enable the development community um, as they are going through their proof of concepts, as they're becoming more agile, as they're actually doing the the true continuous integration, the, cu the continuous delivery of that proof of concept that ultimately will land into production. So what we want to provide is the tools in order to, to you know, provide either the line of business owner or the business element of the IT organization of you know, maybe the cost associated with you know, how much it's, you know, that particular development effort is taking you know, by looking at how much their you know, public cloud provider is charging. Um, we might be able to leverage different infrastructure, so you can leverage the you know uh, on-prem and in the cloud, the public cloud, 
And so we're, we're have with Cloud Center, you're able to actually take either uh, in Workload Manager, you're able to actually set up you know, that infrastructure and place that workload there. You're able to use Action Orchestrator to glue a variety of different uh, either scripts or languages or you know, whatever element that the developer is friendly or familiar with. And then you're also to actually leverage the cost associated. So I get an update on how much this is costing me as the developer is going through their, their cycle. All right, Ali, let's, let's, uh, let's, let's attack that statement, glue. glue. Who doesn't like a glue layer? But at the expense <laughs> of throwing away what I got, right. it's not cool, right? People don't Absolutely. want, they want to be, I love to create more opportunities to glue things together, make it more integrated with data modeling going back and forth, I love that. How does a use, uh, uh, your customer, in this case a DevOps or developer or technical architect, get the best of a glue layer like feature at the same time not compromising any disruption to how they do their business. So, perfect, um, so a lot of the work that they already invested inside their um, DevOps work could be there, however, like I mentioned about the orchestration section is that uh, the ability to introduce any custom adapters are also available, correct? So there are out of the box adapters for Ansible, Terraform, and um, many more for rest, RESTful API calls. And, um, and if a team requires to do a custom, ad, uh, um, custom adapt, adapter creation uh, via an, an SDK that they have inside, they can simply inter, uh, implement it because of the interface that's available. So that's where I feel that the glue is where it comes to the orchestration level. Now, where Matt pointed out on the cost optimizer, this is very key because the real-time data that Cost Optimizer is providing from the underlying clusters that we have our services running provides us, if you tie that, and, and then again, I'll, I want to use the word glue here, <laughs> if you tie that with the orchestration engine, you can do real-time system decision-making on knowing that the next service that you're introducing, now think about it, when we're talking about companies, huge companies, right, 200 plus microservices. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not talking about one or two, and there are out there. And when we're talking about those number of microservices, cost becomes important. Where should I be able to push the next service? Should I push it, in, if it's in my public cloud, should I go to Azure, or should I go to AWS, right? And cost is a key factor there as well, right? Uh, let's explain cost. I mean, cost for the more is cash. Um, but there's also cost in code, there's cost in, in operations. When, do you mean cost in terms of actually hard dollars? Or are you talking about cost of cost to the service, impact to the system, or both? What's that? Well, I mean, why do I care if I'm a technical person? Hey, someone else is paying the bills. Correct. So, um, a couple of things as a technical person's concerned is that when it comes down to uh, cost aside, but where the orchestrator actually plays a role, and when it comes to where deployment needs to happen on which cloud is key. As a technical person, sometimes our environments and our persistence layers that we have services connecting to require only access to private data. So it cannot go into the public sector. So that service needs to be deployed onto the private cloud. Whereas you have other services that have to live on the edge because they communicate with the internal cloud. So those services need to be pushed onto that public. So it's here that the suite basically gives you the opportunity to do all of that automatically without any um, you know, interference at all. And, you know, and I'll just dive in. I mean, I think that the, the, the thing that, um, you know, if I was a line of business owner, right? I, I'm really looking for my development community and my team to move faster. I don't want to necessarily slow them down. So I want to be able to say, hey, if there is a service within Azure, if there is something within Google Cloud that really um, helps you develop either faster or provides a service that makes the functionality the experience better, I want the developer to be able to use that as a target infrastructure. At the same time, you know, I also want to go, okay, so as we're building out this application or this service, is it growing out of bounds out of, in cost? Is, it, is this something that I can actually sort of take to production? 
and then I have a, an awareness of exactly when they go through the unit test, the integration test, how much this is actually going to cost. It's a fascinating conversation. Certainly, I'd on our next segment, we do more of these interviews. I'd love to drill into technical debt, but I'll ask you guys while we're here. Technical debt is something that developers are used to dealing with, especially when they want to go from idea to POC. You take chances, it's technical debt, and people have a good form for balancing technical debt. Costs also factors in other things like that. And when you add microservices to the equation, this service is going up and down. You don't know what's happening. So automation comes into a big part of this. So this idea of getting from point A to point B, whether it's idea to POC or POC to production, mm -hmm. there's sometimes technical debt involved. There's sometimes thinking around that. How does the platform help there? Is that something that you guys um, help developers with? Because that's something, I'll take a chance. If I want to get a POC up and running, maybe I take some technical debt to try to get it going, then I'll fill in after. <laughs> right, so I think like Matt mentioned about the different components that play inside the suite, you know, you have the infrastructure handled by uh, workload manager. You have your orchestration again by AO. Um, you have cost optimizer providing costs. The ability to set up your system inside these components and then template, creating a template out of it so that later when you want to challenge technical depth, you're not reinventing things. So you have already you already have templates created. So um, going back and dealing with technical depth is about how you can take your templates to the next version. Um, so and that's in line with DevOps thinking, iteration. Exactly. You know, go just keep it agile, keep it going. Absolutely. What's your guys' take on automation, obviously, when you look at the, the biggest trends in multi-cloud and hybrid cloud, you know, two things pop up in this new cloud architecture. Observability and automation are two hot trends, which is essentially observability is just network management on steroids and automation is configuration management on steroids. So yeah. the world's kind of the same, but evolving. Yeah. I mean, yeah. this is in your, both are in your wheelhouse for yeah. Cisco as a company. Yeah, hey, so the, uh, and another element that I think we haven't really talked about was, you know, we have a container platform that actually will um, leverage the APIs to either the public cloud or on-prem to like a ESSI, ESXi host on, on VMware. Um, and what I, uh, what that provides is to leverage the best of where that particular service would reside. If it's on-prem because of particular use cases of data sovereignty or or just locality, you know, hey, work your put your workload there. Um, if you want to leverage something that's in the pro uh, public cloud and because of a service or something, we're not actually putting a cluster on AWS. We're leveraging EKS. We're connecting via APIs you know, the, the cluster that you are controlling uh, from the control plane all the way to the workload or the worker node that would actually be uh, spun up within EKS. So we're trying to bridge that on-prem world to the public cloud. So very much hybrid cloud, that connectivity piece and being able then to understand, you know, the, the, the connectivity and the, the, the workloads that go there. Bridge, an old school term. Bridge, it yes. It means something, yes. bridge. Yes. Gateways, yes. internetworking, yes. cloud, same movie, different generation, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Moving up the stack, but this yeah. is serious, this is going on. People yeah. want to have things move around. Right. It takes a lot of networking knowledge, but it's all being done now with software with a lot of automation and abstraction. Right. This yeah. is why I think the DevOps and the net DevOps world, whatever we're calling it, right. is really creating this new abstraction layer. So, um, great conversation. Let's bring it all together to end, end this up. Bottom line, I'm a technical person, I have responsibility, my boss is saying, go faster, be agile, be DevOps, but we've got the, all this legacy to deal with. Right. Um, why Cisco platform, what's the bottom line? Yeah, with the container platform, what we're trying to do is enable IT to have the tools that they can actually uh, enable the speed and agility for their developers. And that's really the bottom line. And we're trying to you know, just basically empower and move at the speed of agile. So IT is now a part of the the process of innovation and proof of concepting. Um, I know the challenge though is governance, policy, security, all the things, the connectivity, those are the elements that we're bringing to the table for the IT you know, uh, ops organization that, that can also sort of like go, I am uh, able to provide that for their, for their developers. And Ellie, your perspective, you're one, you're one of us, you're a technical brother, what's the bottom line, why should I take a chance, why should I implement this platform? Because developers really want to code at the end of the day, and they want to just focus on their business logic. They want the system to be automated. They want the system to be self-healed. And just like what Matt said, right, 
this suite basically gives you that so that you just focus on your code and your business logic, nothing else. Awesome. Guys, great conversation. Looking forward to following up. I think there's a lot to unpack. I think as this cloud 2.0 world or whatever it's being called is about modernization of the enterprise and it's going to be around for a long, long time. Thanks for sharing your uh, expert opinions and commentary. Appreciate it. Thank you very Thanks much. This is theCUBE here in Palo Alto for CUBE Conversations. Thanks for watching.